All right, so picking up where we left off in lab, we went over the forearm muscles and we got to some of the arteries and nerves, but a little bit um, of the deeper ones we couldn't really see too well. So let's go over some of those deeper structures. We'll see the deep muscles in that anterior forearm and then we'll look at the anterior interosseous artery and nerve and where they're coming from. So now we've got the deep dissection of the forearm completed so that you can see the different branches of the nerves and arteries a little bit better. So what the probe's under right now are the tendons of this flexor digitorum profundus, right? And remember the three deep muscles, you've got the flexor digitorum profundus here. You've got this, which is your flexor pollicis longus. And then right in between those two at the wrist, well, just proximal to the wrist, Right there, that's going to be your pronator quadratus. Now notice diving right in kind of deep to that pronator quadratus along this shiny white area, which is your interosseous membrane, you have your anterior interosseous artery and nerve here and the veins in there too. So if we follow those, remember, we want to know where those are coming from, right? So if we follow these back to the cubital fossa area, we've got our brachial artery here splitting into the radial and the ulnar arteries. And then coming off the ulnar artery here, you can see this would be that anterior interosseous artery here, right along there, see? And so remember that's supposed to come from the common interosseous artery. And this one is a little bit odd because it doesn't really have a trunk. It just kind of has the anterior and posterior interosseous coming straight off of it. So this one would be that anterior interosseous, and then that is your posterior interosseous. Notice it's diving through that little opening in the proximal part of that interosseous membrane. So this would be posterior interosseous artery, and we would see that if we flipped the forearm over and did the deep part of the posterior forearm, and then this would be that anterior interosseous artery right here, and it travels right with that anterior interosseous nerve. So remember the anterior interosseous nerve is coming from the median nerve. So if we go back up in the cubital fossa area, this is that median nerve and it's actually really pretty. You can see it innervating these other anterior forearm muscles that we've reflected, all of these little innervating branches there, beautiful. You can also then see here these branches coming off. So you can see it's innervating these muscles as well as this anterior interosseous nerve. So just remember the anterior interosseous nerve is coming from median. The anterior interosseous artery typically comes from ulnar. So you have ulnar artery. This is another branch. I don't think you need to know this one, but it's a recurrent branch. And then you've got a couple others here. Then the ulnar artery, remember, continues. So after it gives off those two anterior posterior, it continues here as the ulnar artery, ulnar artery to the wrist and then into the hand where it forms that superficial arch. The radial artery itself stays this way laterally and travels down the forearm to then go through that snuff box. Now let's flip that forearm over and see the posterior surface and then we'll be able to see that uh, posterior interosseous artery popping through and going to the posterior compartment and we'll also be able to follow the posterior interosseous nerve which is coming from the deep branch of the radial. So we'll try to find the splitting of that radial nerve. We had the anterior interosseous nerve coming off the median nerve and we had the anterior, anterior interosseous artery coming off the ulnar artery and now if we flip it over and look this is the radial nerve coming around um, right by your brachial radialis here. So this would be the radial nerve. And then remember it splits into the superficial and deep branches of the radial nerve. So here, this would be the deep branch. This would be the superficial branch. And then that superficial branch stays just deep to that brachial radialis here to go to the back of the hand. Whereas the deep radial nerve is going to innervate a couple muscles and then it will give off that posterior interosseous nerve I guess it turns into the posterior interosseous after it pierces and goes through um, supinator. So that is supinator. And then right where it peaks out here, this would be that posterior interosseous nerve or that PIN. And you can see that right next to it right there. That's that posterior interosseous artery that we saw from the opposite side. So remember it came through that little hole in the interosseous membrane. So to recap, we've got radial nerve splitting into superficial and deep radial nerves. Superficial stays just deep to that brachioradialis. The deep 
innervates a couple, goes deep to these muscles, pierces and innervates the supinator, and turns into posterior interosseous nerve, meets up with posterior interosseous artery from the anterior side. All right, now that we've finished up pretty much all of the forearm, we're going to briefly review some of those superficial anterior forearm muscles and a little bit of the deeper muscles that we just saw, and we'll see how those are going through the wrist and the carpal tunnel to get into the hand. Then we'll go over the different structures in the palmar surface of the hand, and finally we'll end with the dorsum of the hand. Okay, so this is a, a view of the anterior forearm and hand, and we're going to walk through mostly just the hand dissection. But to orient you, you have your pronator teres, flexor carpi radialis, ulnaris longus, and flexor carpi ulnaris right here. So I labeled these for you on these pictures just because I know when we're moving around with the video, it can be kind of hard to follow along, especially when there's a distracting background. So here I've highlighted the pronator teres in this bluish color. Just next to that, you can see the flexor carpi radialis muscle in the green, and you can see where it's cut at the carpals. That's the other green right at the wrist level there. Just next to that, in the reddish color here, you can see the palmaris longus muscle. And then lastly, on the ulnar side, or the most medial, you're going to see that flexor carpi ulnaris muscle in the yellow here. So those are the four in the superficial layer of the anterior compartment of the forearm, and you can remember those by PFPF. PF. So again, pronator teres, flexor carpi radialis, palmaris longus, and flexor carpi ulnaris. Just keep in mind that some people, about 15 to 30-ish percent of people, don't have a palmaris longus. So don't let that trick you if you're trying to count your way through. Now remember that the intermediate layer of the anterior forearm is going to have one muscle, which I've highlighted here in the purple, and that is going to be your flexor digitorum superficialis muscle. So... At the wrist, we're gonna go through the different muscles in the carpal tunnel. So you can see that the flexor retinaculum has been cut here to open up the carpal tunnel. You can see all these tendons. So superficial to that flexor retinaculum. So pretend your flexor retinaculum is here. Superficial to that, you have this tendon, which is your palmaris longus tendon. And that's why if you flex at the wrist, if you have a palmaris longus, it's pretty easy to see. Um, here you can see that it inserts on the palmar aponeurosis as well as the palmaris brevis here. So the palmaris brevis, this, this side was attached to the skin, this side is attached to the, palm, uh, the palmar aponeurosis, and so that one again, remember, that's going to help with grip. That's the only intrinsic hand muscle that's innervated by the superficial branch of the ulnar nerve. All of the other muscles in the hand are going to be innervated by the deep branch of the ulnar nerve or um, a branch of the median nerve. So here we've got that palmar aponeurosis, the palmaris brevis, and the tendon of the um, palmaris longus here. So. so here just to highlight that for you, you can see the palmaris longus muscle again in that reddish color, and you can see it inserting on that palmar aponeurosis, which I've highlighted in the orange color there for you. And then you can also see that palmaris brevis muscle attaching to that palmar, palmar aponeurosis as well, which I've highlighted in the bluish color over here. So we're going to reflect that out of our way. And now you can see the superficial structures. So again, coming back out here, this would be that ulnar artery. And remember the ulnar artery is gonna come into the hand and form the superficial arterial arch. So here you can see this is all arch here. So this is the ulnar artery crossing that wrist. Remember with the wrist, it's very superficial. It turns into that arch here and then it gives off a couple branches. So here, this would be an example of a common palmar digital branch. And remember, anytime we have common, it's probably going to split again. So from here to here would be common palmar digital branch. And then right in here, you can see it splitting into two. This is really hard with one hand. <laughs> but here, you can see that it's splitting into two right here. And those are gonna go on either side of these fingers. So these little ones are gonna be your proper palmar digital branches. So you had the ulnar artery turning into that superficial arterial arch, giving off the common palmar digital branches, which then split into the proper palmar digital branches. So here's another common, here's another common here. And then remember the superficial arterial arch is gonna be mostly coming from the ulnar artery, but it does have a communication with the radial, which is what this small little branch over here is. It's gonna communicate with the radial artery a little bit deeper. Um, 
And then it also does communicate over here. Let's see if you can see this. So on this side, we zoom out, this is the pinky side. So you have your thenar compartment. So we're in the hypothenar compartment here. So if we look at this, this would be that ulnar artery coming into the arch and it gives off this communicating branch that goes in between two muscles in the hypothenar compartment. So this would be your abductor, digiti minimi, uh, extra digiti minimi brevis, and it dives right in there to get deeper. So there we go, now you can really see it. So that branch is going to go down and communicate with the deep arch, okay? So that's the arteries. So just to recap on those, the red is highlighting that ulnar artery traveling down to about the level of the wrist where it then starts to arch and turns into the superficial palmar arterial arch. And then you can see the common palmar digital arteries coming off of that in the palm. And then you can see each of those splitting into a proper palmar digital artery to go to either sides of the fingers. Now in the hand, you're gonna have your median nerve popping right out of that carpal tunnel. So let's go over that. Remember in the forearm, the median nerve is gonna travel right in between this, which is your flexor digitorum superficialis, and this, which is your flexor digitorum profundus. So right here, that's that median nerve. So here I wanted to be sure to highlight this one because when I'm holding it up, I'm actually holding part of that flexor carpi radialis too, so be careful. Um, what I'm holding that I've highlighted in the purple is that flexor digitorum superficialis. And then here in the green, you can see that that is the flexor digitorum profundus. And then right in between those, you can see that median nerve. So we have reflected now the four tendons of that flexor digitorum superficialis going through that carpal tunnel. Okay, we're in the carpal tunnel. Now, right here, that's gonna be that median nerve. So if we zoom out, this is median nerve. And then once it, it'll be in the carpal tunnel. And remember, before it goes in the carpal tunnel, it gives off that palmar cutaneous branch. And then it travels through the carpal tunnel. It'll come out where it gives off this branch here, which is your recurrent branch. And the recurrent branch of the median nerve is coming out right here, and it's going to the thenar compartment muscles. So your abductor pollicis brevis, your flexor pollicis brevis, and then a little bit deeper to those, that would be that opponent's pollicis. Um, so here, that's that recurrent branch. These other branches that are coming off median nerve here, so this is still the artery. They're kind of like intertwined right here. So, but just focus on these. And those are gonna be some of the nerves coming off. So again, this would be your common palmar digital. And then here where it splits out here to go to the fingers. Well, you can't really see that one because of the thumb. So let's follow this one. So this would be a common palmar digital branch, continuing, continuing. And then out here where it gets to the finger, you can see it splitting into two. So it'll split into the proper palmar digitals to go to either side of the finger, okay? And then deep to that, inside that carpal tunnel, you'll have those four tendons here, which are your um, flexor digitorum profundus. And remember, those are where the lumbrical muscles originate. This is the first tendon of that flexor digitorum profundus, and you can see that this is actually a lumbrical muscle originating on it. So here it's originating, and then remember on this side, it's gonna be on the palmar side, and then it's gonna come around and wrap over to get to the um, extensor hoods on this side. So this is that lumbrical from a side view right there. So tendon of flexor digitorum profundus, lumbrical muscle, and then you can see the other ones, same thing. If we kind of move these out of our way, you're seeing the same things under there. So these are the tendons of the flexor digitorum superficialis moved out of the way to see the other lumbricals. So here highlighted in the green, you can see that flexor digitorum profundus. And again, remember it's going through that carpal tunnel and then towards the distal ends of the fingers, you can see it's going in between the flexor digitorum superficialis tendons, which I've highlighted in the purple. So you can see those are splitting and then the green, which is the profundus tendons are going in between those. And then lastly, you can see that first lumbrical muscle originating on the tendon of the profundus. And so all together, they're all labeled for you here. Now you can see them, if this was still just a superficial dissection, you can see them in between when all of this is still in place. So if this was all not dissected deeper, um, I think I have a picture that I can put in here. But 
So here's a picture. This is a different dissection, but I wanted you to be able to see the lumbricals in that uh, superficial dissection. So here are those lumbricals right here. But you'd have lumbrical there, lumbrical here, lumbrical here, and then the fourth lumbrical is over here. So there's your lumbricals. So again, this is a different dissection, but what I've highlighted with the green dots right there, those are the tendons of the flexor digitorum profundus, and you can see those lumbricals in between them and how they're actually originating on those different tendons. Now, those are the um, flexor digitorum superficialis and the flexor digitorum profundus tendon. So we know that all of those are going to go through that carpal tunnel, and then the profundus has the lumbricals originating on them. Then once you get more distal, remember that the flexor digitorum superficialis tendon is only going to go to the middle phalanx. So here, this is that superficialis, and then it's going to insert on that middle phalanx. So when it contracts, it's going to flex at the wrist, flex at the MCP, flex at the PIP, or the proximal interphalangeal, or PIP, and then it'll stop here. So it does not act on that distal inter interphalangeal joint. Whereas the profundus tendons, so see how this one's deeper, you have that lumbrical on it. This is the tendon of profundus. It is gonna go all the way to the distal phalanx. So you'll see it going through this split in the superficialis tendon. So this is a really beautiful structure right here. You can see that's the split of the superficialis profundus going through there to insert on the distal. And that is why the distal interphalangeal joint or dip is only going to be um, acted on by the profundus. Let's look at this one. So we had the eight tendons that go through the carpal tunnel that we just went over. We also went over the median nerve. So remember you have a ninth tendon that goes through that carpal tunnel, which is here. So this is actually the tendon of that flexor pollicis longus. So you have the muscle belly up in the forearm. It's gonna travel through that carpal tunnel here, wrap up around the thumb and then travel out to that distal phalanx of the thumb. So I've dissected it out here so you can kind of like pull it out and see the whole thing. Um, so there, that is your flexion. So that's the contents of the carpal tunnel. So we had our nine tendons and our one nerve. So now if we go deeper than that, we're going to see a couple other muscles. So here you can see the muscle belly of the flexor pollicis longus, and then you can follow the tendon through the carpal tunnel and out to the distal phalanx of that thumb. But let's rewind and go over these thenar and hypothenar compartments. So in the hand, you've got a bunch of different compartments of intrinsic muscles. So here, this is gonna be that thenar compartment. You're gonna have three muscles. The first one is your abductor pollicis brevis, which you can see highlighted here in the pink. And then just next to that, that's your flexor pollicis brevis highlighted in the blue. And keep in mind, these aren't fully separated yet, so um, you can't really see the separation between them fully, and you can't really see the opponent's pollicis deep to them quite yet. And then kind of deep and in between those, that's where you're going to have your opponent's pollicis. And then you have the same corresponding muscles on the pinky side, but they are now going to be called digiti minima instead of pollicis because we're talking about the pinky. So again, outermost, this is going to be the abductor digiti minima. This is going to be your flexor digiti minima brevis. And then if we go and reflect that a little bit, you can see the opponent's digiti minima in there. So here highlighted for you in the pink is that abductor digiti minimi muscle, and then just next to it in the blue, that's the flexor digiti minimi brevis, and then deep to those you'd find the opponents. Now, you can also see the innervation of these, which is pretty cool. So here, if you follow that ulnar nerve, so here's our ulnar nerve and our ulnar artery. If you follow the ulnar nerve here, remember we saw the ulnar artery making that arch, Here's that nerve, and remember the ulnar nerve is gonna innervate almost all of the muscles in the hand. So you can actually see it giving off little innervating branches right there to the hypothenar muscles, which is pretty beautiful. Um, so you can see that innervation, and remember we saw that recurrent branch of the median nerve coming off of here that was innervating the thenar. So the thenar compartment muscles are gonna be innervated by median, the recurrent branch, and the hypothenar muscles, those are gonna be innervated by the deep branch of the ulnar nerve, okay? The lumbricals, we just saw those. Remember those, two of them are gonna be innervated by ulnar and two are gonna be innervated by median. So if you think of where these nerves are traveling, it makes more sense that the um, medial two are going to be innervated by ulnar, so this one, 
and this one are going to be innervated by ulnar and you can actually see little branches of the nerve coming off to innervate those as well um, the other two the first two are going to be innervated by median so actually you can see that here you can see an innervating branch coming off so if we look out this would be median that recurrent branch here and then all of these little branches coming off are going to be innervating some of the muscles, um, those two lumbricals, but also then going out to supply the cutaneous innervation on those fingers. But here's that innervating branch going to the lumbrical here. So this would be median nerve branches of it. And you can see this little innervating branch going right to this little lumbrical right here. So the first two lumbricals, again, those are median, the second two lumbricals, which are lumbricals three and four, those are gonna be innervated by ulnar. And remember, those are going to do flexion at the MCP, like my knuckles right there, so flexion at the MCP. But then notice that my fingers are straight, so it's extending at the proximal interphalangeal and the distal interphalangeal joints. So it does this movement. So normally when we're talking about flexion, that would all be flexion of all of those joints, right? But if we're talking about the lumbricals specifically, they're gonna flex at my knuckle, AKA that MCP joint, and then they're gonna extend at these two. So the reason for that, again, is they originate on these tendons, they're gonna wrap over to the other side and insert on the extensor hoods. So those are um, the three main compartments here. You also then have this compartment, which includes the adductor, a DD um, pollicis muscle. So the adductor pollicis, if we pull all of these out of the way, that is your adductor pollicis. So, We've now kind of reflected all of our different tendons and muscles and we're looking really deep inside the hand. So that right there would be your transverse head and the oblique head of the adductor pollicis. So you can imagine when that contracts, it's going to adduct that thumb, right? You can kind of see it in there. And then remember you have your pad muscles or your palmar interossei, and those are kind of hard to see unless we cut this stuff. And I don't wanna cut it because it's, it's nice and it's helpful, but you can kind of see a sneak peek of them in there. That muscle right there that we're kind of peeking in at, that would be one of the palmar interossei muscles. And then you can also see the deep arch right there. And remember that's coming mainly from the radial artery. So a deductor pollicis, palmar interossei muscles. All right, I wanted you to be able to see it. This is that same picture I had in my lecture um, from a different dissection, but with the dotted blue lines, you can see the transverse head of the adductor pollicis, and the green dotted line shows the oblique head of the adductor pollicis with the stars, the red stars showing two of those uh, palmar interosseous muscles. Now, the other palmar interosseous muscle is gonna be deep to that adductor pollicis. So you have to kind of reflect that, which now you can see that here. And when you're at this level, you can also see the ulnar nerve, the deep branch of that ulnar nerve coming in, which I've put the dotted green line on. But importantly, you can also finally see the full um, deep palmar arterial arch. So starting over on the left side of the picture over here, that's what's coming through from the radial artery, which is the main contribution to this. And so this came, remember, between those two heads of the adductor pollicis, forms the main part of that arch. And then you can see the communication coming from that ulnar artery as well. Now the adductor pollicis, this is an important one because this is the only intrinsic hand muscle that attaches to and functions on the thumb that is innervated by the ulnar nerve. So remember these three muscles in the thenar compartment, those are all innervated by that recurrent branch of the median nerve but the adductor pollicis is actually innervated by the deep branch of the ulnar nerve. So that's why if you have an ulnar nerve injury, um, you will have loss of adduction of the thumb. And that can be kind of confusing when you're first learning this because most of the other thumb muscles are going to be innervated by median. Um, or if they're in the snuff box, then those would be innervated by radial, right? So we had our three thenar muscles, our three hypothenar muscles. We had our lumbricals kind of in the middle. We had our adductor pollicis we had our palmar interossei muscles. And then last but not least, we're gonna have our dorsal interossei, which we have to look at the dorsal part of the hand. Coming in here, we have a lot of the superficial um, cutaneous nerves and a lot of these small little um, veins in here. But for right now, our focus is gonna be those muscles. So here, this would be that first dorsal interosseous muscle or dab. Um, 
and you can kind of see it in between the bones here. So these are in the interosseous compartment because they're gonna be in between those metacarpals. So here, dorsal interosseous one, then right under here, that would be dorsal interosseous two, right there. And then deep to these, you'd find three and four. So if you reflect off all of those tendons and clean it up a bit, this is what the dorsal interossei muscle actually look like on the dorsum of the hand here. So these tendons, notice that these are the extensor digitorum tendons. And I wanted to point out the extensor hoods here. So all of these are kind of connected, which is why it can be hard sometimes if you're just trying to extend like one finger because they're all kind of connected here. So like it's pretty easy for your index finger, which if you remember from your forearm, you have that extensor indices that can kind of function itself. But all of these other ones kind of extend together, which is why it's really kind of difficult to do this. I mean, maybe you're better at it than me, but it's really hard sometimes because all of these tendons are um, connected here. So the one that I wanted to point out that oftentimes people confuse for a tag is here. So this is a side view, like looking at this as if someone's gripping something. This is that first dorsal interosseous muscle and this muscle here next to it, that's actually that adductor pollicis just from a different view. So when you look at it kind of like from the side here, there, that's when it gets kind of confusing. So you can see Here's your thumb. This would be that first dorsal interosseus. That would be that adductor pollicis. So if we go to the other side and look at it, that's what you're seeing there. So now you can kind of see both. So the one closer to us in this view would be that adductor pollicis right there. And that would be that dorsal abductor or that dorsal interosseus muscle. And then if you wanted to review the cutaneous things, Back here on the back of the hand, we have the dorsal venous arch of the hand, and that's formed by this small branch of the cephalic vein coming in and kind of looping around and forming this arch and communicating with the other small veins here. Mainly, this is um, one of the smaller branches of that basilic, so they're all gonna kind of come around and form that arch. You also have some cutaneous innervation. Now, be careful with the innervation of the hand remember that the sensory innervation is going to be different than the motor. So here, this is that radial nerve coming under that, this is that superficial radial nerve coming deep from that brachioradialis. And then if we follow it, it's going to pop out here, come around and go to that first um, inter, interdigital space here, kind of in between the thumb and the index finger. So that's your superficial radial. Notice that it's also giving off a branch here. So all of these little branches here and here, are, those are branches of that superficial radial nerve too. So hopefully that helps you visualize why this area is innervated sensory-wise by the radial. Um, then lastly, over here, um, you can also see the difference in the tendons of the extensor digitorum and that extensor digiti minimi muscle over here. See how they come off separately? They actually travel under two different tendinous sheaths here. And then you can also see that the flexor, not the flexor, the extensor retinaculum is still intact. So over here, you've got snuff box. So abductor pollicis longus, extensor pollicis brevis, extensor pollicis longus. So what should you be finding traveling through here? you should find that radial artery, right? And that's exactly what you're seeing kind of popping through, right? <laughs> right here. That's actually your radial artery, right on the probe there. So it's gonna travel through that snuff box. It's gonna pass in between the two heads of the adductor pollicis, where it then is gonna form that deep arch that we saw in that really deep view on the palm of the hand. So that's it for the review of the hand and wrist and a little bit of forearm. Hopefully that helps um, kind of understand where things are coming from and where they're going. Remember with these, that you shouldn't have to memorize all of the different names of these. They really make sense if you think about them. You know, if it has flexor in the name, it's going to flex. If it has pronator in the name, it's going to pronate. Um, things like that can really help you instead of just trying to memorize your way through all of this. It's, it's so much better to spend time to understand things because you'll have longer retention of that knowledge as opposed to just kind of cramming it all and memorizing it now and then having to relearn it all for 
step or other exams. Oftentimes, anatomy is thought of as, you know, pure rote memorization, but actually a lot of it makes sense if you just think about, you know, where the structures are and what they're doing. So hopefully that helps. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out.